live now. We can You're start. Live? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Namaste, and good afternoon. This is Manashvi, and on behalf of Foroptum, I welcome you all to Foroptum e Learning Session. The Foroptum e Learning Session is an initiative by Foroptum, and it is an interactive program where we discuss optometric topics. This session is uh, live on YouTube, and if you have any queries, you can type them out in the conversation box, and we will be discussing them after the presentation. Today, we have with us Dr. Grace, who will be speaking. Speaking on the topic vision therapy and learning related vision problems. A brief introduction to our speaker here, Dr. Grace V holds Masters of Optometry and has worked in full scope independent optometry practice and has helped pioneer and transition the practice more into behavioral optometry practice. She has vast experience and vision therapy skills and has been exposed to many accommodative convergence dysfunctions, amblyopia strabismus, children with learning difficulties and special needs. And she was also awarded with Fellowship of Australia College of Behavioral Optometrist in 2018. Recently, Dr. Grace completed Certificate of Ocular Therapeutics in 2019, and she has presented papers and articles in various conferences and workshops. So on behalf of our Optum team, I welcome you, ma'am. Thank you, Vanashwe. Hello, hello, and welcome to tonight's webinar. I actually hope that everybody can hear me. If you guys can't hear me, or if there's any technical problems, please let Manash we know, okay? And then I'm sure we can do something about it if there's any problems coming up. So thank you for the very kind introduction, Manash we. So my name is Grace. I'm quite informal about um, how people approach me. I am an optometrist from Sydney, Australia. So I'm pretty humbled and excited to be presenting on tonight's topic, which is vision therapy on learning related vision problems. So quickly, I just want to thank the committee in For Optum for organizing this webinar tonight. Uh, this is my first webinar ever. So it's a little bit strange on talking to a computer rather than in front of an audience. So hopefully I can serve you all well tonight by de delivering valuable content, which will be useful for you later on in your professional career. So I don't think I need to talk a little bit more about myself, um, but I've got, I've been practicing more now for over nearly 15 years in optometry. Um, and during that time, I've developed a special interest in a subsection of optometry known as behavioral optometry, which I would explain a little bit more later. But um, I won't go through for what I've done since Manashwi has given me a very um, kind and very detailed introduction about my history in optometry. So let's move on. Enough about me. So who's ever watching tonight, I, I want you guys to ask yourself, what is vision? What is your definition of vision? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. Think about what you think. What what do you what do you think vision is? Okay. All right. So you probably have a few moments now to think about what vision is. I am going to now move on to the next slide. Okay. So a little bit of audience participation here. Normally, I would like to see the comments, but I'll see the comments afterwards. I want you to type in the chat box because I will definitely see it later. What is it that you're seeing at the moment? Okay. Type it in a chat box. What are you seeing at the moment? Or do you see nothing at all? Okay. What do you see? Okay. Let's go to the next slide. How many planks do you see? Okay, so type in the chat box, guys. How many planks do you see? All right, there is no right or wrong answer. Okay, it is an optical illusion. So congratulations to the guys who guess the illusion. But I wanted to demonstrate to you this optical illusion. From we can see four planks. And from the right side, we can actually see three planks, okay? So this is to demonstrate that you can get 
different answers, different perspectives, different ways of looking at the same thing. Okay, so there are different ways of perceiving the same thing from various people. Okay, so if I go back to this image there, okay, so if some of you said that that was a rabbit, you are right. If some of you said that was a duck or a bird, you are also correct. Let me point it out to you for those who don't see it. So for a rabbit, where my cursor is, there's the ears, there's the eyes, and that's the front where the nose is, okay? For those who don't see the bird or the duck, okay, the ears now, can you now see that it's the beak, okay? Still the eyes, and that's the back of the head, okay? But if you look at the image itself, okay, essentially the image is made up of a collection of lines or a bunch of lines. However, our brain forms these lines into an image that we perceive based from our previous visual experiences or from where we are previously familiar, familiar with, okay? So for some of you guys, you saw a rabbit, but when I pointed out, okay, you can now see the duck and vice versa. Okay, so even though essentially it's a bunch of lines, your visual perception of the image have now changed because I've shown you a different way of looking at the image. Okay, so and that is essentially what vision therapy does. So with vision therapy, particularly for learning related vision problems, okay, those who are not doing well in the classroom, will have a different way of processing their visual information compared to those who are doing academically well, okay? So therefore, their way of perceiving and interpreting their visual world is different from others. So what vision therapy does is rewire the way they process their visual information to help them function easier in the classroom, okay? So if you're interested in this subsection of optometry, vision therapy has the potential to impact a child's life, okay? So if you change their visual perception of their world and how they interact and obtain meaning with it, you change their visual reality, okay? And the out outcome is, is that this kid will be a different kid from before. Okay, and I also want to highlight that underperforming in school is associated with a myriad of other things as well. Okay, there's an emotional component, there's a social component, even a family component to it. Okay, the fact that, you know, if you're not performing well, you start to have low confidence, low self esteem, the label of being dumb, bullying by friends or other children, you know, feeling like you're not enough. Okay. So, and if the child finds it all too hard in the classroom, they can act as the class clown or being the troublemaker simply to, because they're trying to divert you away from the actual problem. When they reach high school, and if they feel like school is all too hard because in high school, it doesn't get any easier. You'll be studying more things. You'll be reading, there's more information to retain. Okay, they, if they find it all too hard, they may potentially get into further trouble like mixing with the wrong crowd or being in a gang, for example, okay? Or dealing with drugs, or they may potentially even go into depression. So as optometrists, we have the potential to impact the child's life and its future for the better, okay? So think about your role as an optometrist there. So back to the definition of vision, as I asked you all before, Okay, so based on what vision therapy does, in terms of definition of vision, vision is the ability to obtain meaning by seeing and interacting with our visual world. Okay, whereas eyesight, on the other hand, is the ability to see a certain size target at a certain distance, which is essentially meaning we're measuring acuity. Okay, all right, so... I'm not too sure whether you guys have been exposed to this model of vision, but I thought this will be a good chance to show it to you here if you have, 
heaven, okay? So this model of vision was designed by Dr. Arthur Skeffington, okay? And he was known as the father of behavioral optometry. He designed these four circles, okay? And when all these four circles overlap, okay? The part where they all overlap, you have vision as the emergent. So what does that mean? Let me explain to you the circles. So on the top left, you've got this section here known as centering. And what that means is that, where is it? Where is this object in space, in our visual space? So for example, if I grab a pen, where is this pen in my visual space of mine? And in order to know where this pen is in my visual space, I've got to direct my eye movement and my eye teaming skills to locate where this pen is, is in space, okay? And basically that section there, the centering circle, represents our ambient system, okay? If you guys are not familiar with the term ambient system, think of the term magnocellular pathway, okay? so. That system represents our peripheral vision, our ability to uh, motion and movement to know where things are in our periphery. Okay, those are and those are the skills necessary to detect or locate things in space. So, if we move on to the second circle to the top right, we've got identification. So, meaning, what is it? Okay, so if we're searching for something and we need to know what we're looking for. So for example, back to my pen, if let's say I'm looking for my pen, in order to direct my eye teaming skills, my virgin skills or my ocular motor skills to search for my pen, I need to have an idea of what my pen looks like. Okay, so it's the detail. So the pen is it's long, it's got a tip, you know, it's blue in color, okay. So therefore, this section, okay, represents our focal system or otherwise known, if you're more familiar with, if you're not familiar with the word focal system, um, think, of the, um, think of the system, parvocellular pathway. So under that umbrella, okay, is our ability to, is our vision's ability to de detect detail. So acuity, accommodation, Okay, and at higher levels, um, it basically also involves our visual memory and our visualization. The third one on the bottom, okay, is the speech and language, which is the naming. Okay, and that is our verbal component to allow us to communicate what is it that we're looking for and where is it. And lastly, which I would speak about a little bit more tonight, or will be more so uh, my main topic tonight is the anti-gravity circle or the anti-gravity section, meaning where am I in space? And for me, this is probably one of the more important circles, okay? So what it means is that where am I? Where am I in relation to this pen, okay? Where am I in space? In my whole space, where am I? And if I have a pen, where am I to this pen? Okay, the reason why it's so important is that we cannot direct our vergences, our eye teaming, our accommodation and our ocular motor skills accurately if we have no internal awareness of where we are in space. Okay, so for example, if you have a child with no internal or body internal awareness or body awareness or even good control of themselves they were very likely to have very poor visual skills because they have no idea where they are, okay? They have no internal idea, okay? So if you feel as if this model of vision is quite different from what you have learned, that is okay. I just want to introduce you a different way of looking at vision as an optometrist. If you look at this particular model, this is how we look at vision when we examine a child as a behavioral optometrist. And also, why the model we when we implement vision therapy for the kids as well, okay, or even adults need vision therapy. 
Okay, so my, so my topic focus today, um, I'll be talking a little bit about learning related vision problems. So what is it that we experience, um, what kids would experience? And then I will talk a bit more about vision therapy. I will be giving um, examples of activities that we use for vision therapy, okay? Um, vision therapy is such a broad topic to cover under one hour. So I can only give examples. There's many, many activities which you can use to improve a, a child's visual function and visual um, and visual information processing skills. Um, and I'll also be using perceptual skills because it's a little bit easier to say, but visual perceptual, visual information processing, I mean the same thing, are the same thing. Okay. So in terms of this model, as I said, if you can detect poor eye teaming, poor accommodation, little reversals, and so forth, and you can implement all this vision therapy to improve them. But as I mentioned before, if you don't check on all the circles, especially with the body awareness or body control, okay, um, you cannot expect the VT to be longer lasting. It will be successful, you get improvement, but I find it actually more successful if you look at all the four circles, particularly the body awareness, okay? Particularly the anti-gravity circle, okay? So because for example, if a child doesn't know their rights and lefts, if they have no internal awareness of their rights and lefts, how can you expect a child to recognize the letters B, D, P, or Q, okay? Because essentially these letters are all the same shape, but they're orientated differently and they've been given a different name due to their different orientation, okay? So we start from working from themselves first, okay? So, in terms of the learning related visual problems, what are the things that we normally experience, okay? So examples are skipping, rereading, or emitting words when reading a book, okay? Misreading words, poor comprehension, reversal. So for example, letter reversal, sometimes it could be word reversals as well. Low concentration, fatiguing, or even avoiding reading. So meaning that they start out okay in the first few minutes, and then later on, they kind of just drag off. Okay, they become tired, they slow down, and they're not, they lose interest. Okay, poor spelling, they have difficulty remembering the spelling, difficulty with maths, especially when it comes to problem solving maths, poor handwriting or copying skills, and difficulty with sight words. Okay, and these are the necessary visual skills um, that is necessary for the classroom, okay? So let's not forget the functional visual skills. So the ocular motor skills, which is very important for pursuits, the case and tracking. You've got the virgins and the eye teaming skills and you've got the accommodation skills, which allows you to see the text clearly wherever you want to see. Okay, the higher levels is called the visual information or I like to call the perceptual skills. Okay, so we look at primitive reflexes, which I will, I will elaborate on a little bit later. We've got your eye hand skills, okay, which is very important for later on handwriting as well as your tracking skills. You've got your laterality and your directionality. So laterality meaning, do I know? that there's a right and a left, and do I recognize that there's a right and left? Directionality is, do I know, do I know there's a difference between right and left, okay? So you can get a kid that may track from left to right. They read from left to right. When they get to ne the next sentence, they read from right to left, and then left to right, right to left, simply because that they don't recognize the difference between going right and going left. And this is the reason why they're learning to struggle to read, okay? Visual spatial skills, so coming under the reversals and knowing where things are in space. So form perception, this is more so to recognize, um, to visual analysis skills, as well as visual thinking skills. 
And then you've got the visual memory and the visualization skills. So visual memory meaning they obtain a visual image and visualization meaning am I able to create images in my head? Okay, it's, it's the imaginative side of things. So when a child is learning to read, okay, there is less emphasis on the functional skills. Okay, simply because that the text is still pretty big. There's not a lot of words that they have to retain. Okay, so there's less stress on these skills and there's more emphasis on these skills here. Okay, as the child gets, grows, gets older, okay, so they started reading more books and the print becomes smaller. Okay, then there's more an emphasis on these functional skills because you need these skills to efficiently stay on the page and you need to actually have good binocular stamina. What I mean by binocular stamina is that when normally when I check a child, I'll be checking facility, both accommodative and versions facility. This is what I call it as binocular stamina because that's necessary to be able to stay on the page and read clearly and efficiently. Okay, so normally with vision therapy, you will need therapy on both function as well as information processing skills, okay? But for a child that is learning to read, so they're normally like five, six, maybe seven years old, I'll be doing more vision therapy on these skills here, the perceptual skills, but I will also be doing a little bit on functional skills as well. You don't neglect those functional skills. If you get an older child, Okay, like for example, a fifth grader or a 10 year old child that is two years behind reading, you will need to equally both pay attention to both visuals as well as the perceptual skills because somewhere down the line when they're seven, six, six years old, there will be some skills that will definitely be hindered and will be below age or grade equivalent. So you need to focus on both when you're implementing your vision therapy. Okay, so based on the model of vision and what I've just talked about, I think hopefully all of you can actually appreciate that vision therapy is just more than eye exercises, okay? Um, because we're changing the way that they're perceiving their visual information or make of their visual information in the visual world, okay? So essentially it's brain training for visual processing and allowing opportunities for sense, sensory integration necessary for reading and learning. What I mean by sensory integration. So when we're interacting in the classroom, reading in the classroom, learning to read, okay? 80% of what we of what we learn is through vision, okay? But there's components, verbal component as well as an auditory component. So when we enhance the visual component, we also need to allow it to integrate it with the other senses as well. So that's what we call it as sensory integration. And the third part is my little disclaimer, okay? What I like to emphasize is that we as optometrists do not treat learning difficulties, okay? we do not treat learning difficulty. So we cannot claim that we treat dyslexia, for example. Whatever problems that the child may have learning in the classroom, we cannot claim that we treat learning difficulty. Also, we cannot claim that we teach a child to read, okay? We do not that, do that at all. That is not our role. Our role is to simply, simply enhance and optimize the visual component associated with learning. That's all we do, okay? All right, so as I mentioned before, part of the vision therapy regime, okay, is to make sure that the virgins, their accommodation and their ocular motor skills is up to age equivalent or grade equivalent. And these are just some particular examples that I've shown in the slide here. I'm not gonna to elaborate too much on it because there's a lot to go through tonight. But in terms of the virgin skills, you would be doing activities with loose prism, block string, hopefully you will heard of block string, 
kind of with prism flippers, okay, to train the, the binocular stamina or the virgin stamina. And then you've got the accommodation, which you will use the hard chart or the focus chart to teach them to focus from far to near, near to far. And then you will teach them um, accommodation or learning how to accommodate with a loose lens. And then you've, you can do some activities with flippers. And then you've also got training the ocular motor skills. So training up the, pers the pursuits as well as the saccades. So examples of that is head rotations, orbital fixations, Marston ball, which is the swinging ball. So you basically attach it to the ceiling and the ball swings and they improve their pursuits by following and tracking the ball. Leather fixations, which is used to um, train up accurate saccades. And then you've got other games like maze tracking as well. Okay, so retain reflexes or retain primitive reflexes. What are these, okay? So as part of the visual perceptual assessment, what we commonly test for is primitive reflexes. So what are primitive reflexes? So when babies are born and about up to six months, nine months or 12 months, they've got, they're born with these um, involuntary movements and they're called primitive reflexes. So in general, it basically helps with their survival, especially when they're newborn. Okay, and it also helps with um, their overall development and some particular reflexes are associated with vision and it helps with vision development as well. So the prior, an example of that is the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, which actually helps them develop eye hand coordination. So what it is, is that when the baby turns their head to the side, the arms goes like this and that teaches and that helps them form good eye hand coordination because when the hand turns to, head turns to the side, they get to see their arm. Okay, so these reflexes that I mentioned here are associated with vision development. Now, when a baby, when a child, well not baby anymore, but when a child starts to learn to sit up, stand, start to crawl or walk, okay, What's meant to happen is that these involuntary movements are meant to take the back seat. So they're not meant to become dominant anymore. And it and allows for voluntary um, movements to be um, to come into the into the driver's seat. So conscious control. Conscious control is meant to come in place. Okay. But for some kids, okay, uh, the reflexes don't take the back seat. Okay, they still remain dominant and it makes it hard for them uh, to make voluntary movements with their body as well as with their eyes as well. So if we find that they, if the reflexes are not integrated, they're retained, they're still dominant, then we give them particular activities to help them integrate it and for the reflexes to take the back seat and allow the conscious voluntary movement to come into play, okay? And the reason why we give these activities is that it makes the vision, the outcome of the vision therapy more long lasting and successful. Okay, and so as I mentioned before about body awareness and control, the anti-gravity circle, where am I in space? It all starts with the self first. Okay, so if we detect that um, in a child that there's no, they, they, have, they, they have no idea where they are in space, um, we got to start it with them first because before we can apply to processing visual information on the page. So examples of body awareness and control, we've got the bug game, we've got the bear walk and we've got the angels in the snow. So what the bug game actually is, is that the child lies on their back, okay, with their arms and their head, um, the, the, arms, the arms and the legs actually raised, okay? And they've actually got to move their right arm, the left arm, the right leg and the left leg according to the instructions that we give them or the vision therapies give them, okay? So that teaches them control, that teaches them awareness, okay? And you can also add a naming component if they have no idea about their rights and left. So they can say, right hand, left hand, left leg, and right leg, okay? If that's the particular sequence, 
okay? So the emphasis is on timing, okay, and rhythm. So they've got to do it in a rhythmic manner. If they get that internal, internal timing correct, okay, then they've got, some, they've got a very, relatively good body awareness and control. Um, the bear walk is similar to the, um, to the bug game, but instead of lying on their back, they're actually crawling on all fours like a bear, okay? And basically when they're crawling on all fours, they've got to move their hands and their legs in a particular sequence. So right hand, left hand, right leg, then left leg, okay? And then you can also change the sequence as well and see whether they actually remember it and execute it according to your instructions. So you can use right leg, right hand, left leg, right hand. So you can be very creative when you're, um, when you're giving these games to them. Angels in the snow, okay? So I've got a couple of pictures here. Angels in the snow, if you can imagine you're in the snow, Okay, and you're lying on your back in the snow and you're making an angel. Okay, so their primary position when they start, okay, is when their arms are by the side and the legs are stretching out like that. Okay, and when they make an angel, okay, the secondary position is when the arms are raised up to above their heads and the legs are separated, okay. The key part is to be moving the arms and legs at the same time, starting and stopping at the same time. Remember, and so this is to remember, this is to basically getting them to practice awareness as well as control, okay, in a rhythmic motion. Okay, so once they can start and stop making the angels in the snow in a in a, in, in a good rhythmic manner you can start to vary it a little bit to improve their body awareness and control. So you can start off with, that's okay. So now you can make angels in the snow. Now I want you to only move your right hand. Okay, move your right hand. Now move your left leg, moving your left leg. See whether they can isolate these movements or not. If you wanna level up a little bit more, then you can use same side, so right arm and right leg at the same time and see whether they can do left arm and left leg at the same time. And then you can move on to a much higher level, which teaches them bilateral integration, which I will elaborate on a little bit further as well. So bilateral integration is using both sides of the body. So you can see here in the picture, she's raising her left arm and separating her right leg. And she's got to do that at the same time okay so that's angels in the snow not only it teaches about body control um, awareness um, in 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 a rhythmic motion but you can also um, add the right and the left it teaches them body awareness of their rights and lefts okay bilateral integration as well as awareness as well okay so moving on Eye hand skills. So examples of examples of games with eye hand skills, which is pen on a cap or touch the pencil. So we've got in the picture there that this is touch the pencil. So what they do is that they put on a patch, okay, and the finger starts from the ear, and they've got to be touching the pencil from the ear, not very close touching from the ear to develop good eye hand skills. So we get them to patch one eye and they do right hand and then practice with their left hand. Then they switch the patch to the other eye, practice with their right hand, left hand, and then removing the patch using both eyes. Pen on the cap is the same thing, except that the optometrist or the vision therapist will be holding the pen and the child will be holding the cap and they've got to try to place the cap on the pen. So that's one level of eye hand skills. To level up, you've got an ex another example of leveling up is the racetrack. So below there in the example is an example of the racetrack. So you can do this on, let's say a whiteboard, blackboard, or even a large piece of paper. You draw any kind of racetrack. You can make it curvy straight, however you like it, okay? You can be creative. So, and what they have to do is grab a marker or grab a pen, and with my cursor there, so pretending that's the pen or the marker, they've actually got 
to draw within the line. Okay, and normally I tell them, especially it's a ball, it's a car, and it's racing on the racetrack. Okay, what they're not allowed to do is that they're not allowed to touch the sides because if they touch the sides, that means the car has crashed and they've got to start all over again. Okay, and that forces them to keep within the line okay, and develop uh, further develop their eye hand skills. Now, ways of making it more challenging once they become proficient in that game is to make the racetrack skinnier. Okay, so they really have to keep in between the lines. Okay, or you can make the racetrack more convoluted. Okay, so that's one way of making things more challenging for them in order to improve the eye hand skills. Uh, the alphabet tracking or the and arbit tracking is a very high level of eye hand skills because it includes, includes other things like your ocular motor skills as well. So basically, this is an example of the and arbit tracking, just in case you haven't seen it before. Um, you can actually Google Ann Arbor Tracking. They've got websites in the UK as well as the US and you can actually purchase it, okay? And for me, I find this very, very good and they've got different varieties as well. So for kids who don't know their letters, you can also order this in pictures as well and they've got to circle the peach pictures in a particular sequence. Um, they've got words as well. They've got a variety of stuff, but my favorite is the alphabet, okay? So if you really do find it very useful, which I do, please go online and actually purchase it. It's a good investment if you're interested in the vision therapy aspect of optometry. So what it is, is that you've got the letters of the alphabet on the top part, which they can cross check. And then you've got a paragraph of nonsense words, okay? And what they have to do is find the letters of the alphabet in order from A to Z. So imagine my mouse or my cursor is the pencil, okay? The child, what the child has to do is basically draw underneath. Oh, where's my, where's my cursor now? There it is. Okay, so what the child has to do is draw underneath the words, the nonsense words, and when they find the A, they circle the A. They're not allowed to take the pencil off the page. When they find the B, they've got to circle the B. When they find the C, they've got to circle the C. So they've got to find every, every letters, and as you can see in red, there's every letters there, up to Z. Now, for example, let's say they circle D, E, and they miss F. Okay, so for Rob Zero, they miss this F. And they keep going, they keep going searching for the F and they found the F here. If they find the F here and not here, they won't be able to find the rest of the letters of the alphabet, which means that they missed something along the way. It's feedback for them to say they missed something along the way and they've got to start again, okay? Um, the fact that you've got to find 26 letters of the alphabet in particular order, so you've got a sequential component um, you've got your, it was training your eye hand skills. It's also training your ocular motor skills as well, because there's a visual search element to it. So there's actually a lot of skills, um, if, um, involved when you're doing this game and this exercise. Okay. Um, if they come become very proficient, what you can do is you can actually cover the letters of the alphabet, and then you can actually add a memory component to it to make it more challenging. Okay, and I think also with the Ann Arbor tracking as well, they also include large font. So once they become proficient with the large font, you can also int um, introduce the smaller font to make it more challenging for them. Okay, so that's Ann Arbor tracking, guys. Okay, so I've lumped the title laterality and directionality bilateral integration, as well as the visual spatial skills together. And it actually, it really, it, there's a lot of overlap with body awareness and control, okay? Especially with the games, okay? So the games that we, um, that we give are very versatile because it addresses a lot of the, um, a lot of the skills that, did, um, that they may be um, falling below age equivalent. So as I explained earlier, laterality is the knowledge of the rights and lefts, okay? 
Um, and directionality is knowing the difference between going right, left, up, and down, okay? If, a, as I mentioned earlier, if the child has no clue where they are in space, where they're orientating in space, can't expect them to recognize certain things, certain letters in the alphabet, such as B, D, P, or Q. If they don't know the difference between right and they don't know the difference between left, you cannot expect them, okay, to keep reading from left to right when they reach the second letters from left to right if they have no awareness, okay, to them, left to right and right to left, for them, they process it as the same thing. So you need to teach them that. It all starts with self first, okay? So to teach directionality, you've got these arrows here in a form of a chart, so variations of arrows. So if the arrow is pointing up, okay, the child has to jump forward. If the arrow is pointing to the left, okay, that means the child, the child has to jump to the left down, they jump backwards, and the right arrow, they jump to the, they're jumping in space, okay, to practice their awareness and their orientation in their visual world. Okay, so another game, Angels in the Snow, we've already covered that, basically is knowing their right arm, left arm, knowing their right sides and left sides. Bilateral circles, so that game basically involves them you holding both pens, and drawing circles and they have to keep it at the same size while looking at the cross, okay? So bilateral circles helps them integrate both sides of the body known as bilateral integration. So what is bilateral integration? Bilateral integration, okay, it means, just means using both sides which reflects on integrating both the right and the left hemisphere of the brain. Okay, why is this important? Okay, so we may have two eyes, okay? We never use one eye at a time. We actually use two eyes at the same time. When we write, women and hand, but our non-dominant hand serves a purpose as well. In our visual world, we'll be using both sides at the same time, just like when we read, we're using two eyes at the same time. If you think anatomically, okay, from the optic nerve, Half the optic nerve will branch to the right side of the occipital lobe, and half of the optic nerve fiber will branch to the left side of the brain or, or, or to the occipital lobe, okay? Same thing with the other eye as well. So our optic nerve actually branches to two sides of the hemispheres, okay? So that's why bilateral integration is quite important. Um, Another example of bilateral integration, we give them a game called slap tap, which is another um, body movement game. And that would actually um, help them, especially um, with kids who, have, who, have, who are actually reversing, okay, or difficulty knowing the B, Ds, Ps, and Qs. So what is, let me further elaborate slap tap. So this is slap, example of slap tap, guys. So imagine the line here, is the middle of the body, okay? So if they see a symbol, which is on the top part and is curving to the left side, they've got to tap their left arm. Likewise, if they see it on the right side, they've got to tap the right arm, okay? If they see the curve on the bottom towards the left, they tap their left foot. And the same thing, Okay, if the curve is towards the right side, they tap the right foot, okay? So it's a bit like a dancing body rhythmic movement game, okay? Which kids actually find it fun, okay? And to level them up, we teach them to integrate both sides as well. So basically, if they see these symbols, they tap both at the, at the same time, okay? And if they see that symbol, they've got to tap the right hand and their left foot at the same time, okay? All right, form perception, visual analysis, and visual thinking skills, okay. So examples of these games, one of it is GeoBoard and the other one is Parquetry Blocks, okay. So on the right-hand side where you see the picture here is a picture of the GeoBoard. So typically it's a board with 
pins can be wooden pins or metal pins, what it can be any, any kind of pins, typically in a five by five arrangement. The child has to look at the pattern. Okay, so this is the pattern here. So if you guys recognize this pattern, this is a very similar pattern for a visual analysis skills. Okay, so the GeoBot is very, it's very similar to that. So the child has to look at the pattern. Okay, and they have to make the same pattern here on the board using rubber bands. Okay, so in order to make the to replicate the same pattern, okay, it teaches them to pay attention to the visual details of the pattern. Okay, so the components which make up the pattern, which is the focal side of your vision. Okay, but also they need to see where about the pattern is spaced on the board. So not all patterns are spaced. Some patterns can be spaced to the left side, some space to the right side, top or bottom. Okay, so they will need to actually use their global spatial view, okay, to know where to So they also need to recognize that this point here corresponds with this point, and this point here corresponds with this point and so forth, okay, in order to know where the pattern is placed on the overall diagram. So they need to be able to see it, translate it, okay, and replicate it, okay. So this is a very, very good activity to help with visual analysis. And for kids who are having difficulty in maths, that will help them with their maths as well as their problem solving skills as well. Okay. Another visual analysis game, as I, as I just mentioned earlier, is parquetry blocks. So this is an example of parquetry blocks, actual blocks, okay, flat blocks, wooden blocks, typically shaped in a square, triangle, and a diamond or a rhombus. Okay. So normally the optometrist or the vision therapist will have their own set of blocks and the kids will have their own set of blocks. So whatever we, whatever pattern that the vision therapist or the optometrist makes, the kid has to replicate and make the same pattern. So can they actually match it? Okay, so that's one level of visual thinking and analysis skills because when they make the pattern, they've got to learn to recognize that the square is to the left of the triangle and the diamond at, at the bottom of the triangle. So it teaches them uh, um, spatial awareness or where things are in relation to each other. Once they can actually match that, okay, then you can take a level higher and actually introduce a memory component to it. So next slide. So a memory component is you form a, the vision therapist or the optometrist forms a particular pattern you show it to the child for three seconds or maybe more depending on where, where, what level they're at, okay? Then you cover it, okay? Then the child has to replicate the same pattern, okay? So are, are they able to use their visual memory to replicate the same pattern, okay? So that basically enhances their visual memory skills, okay? And for visualization, so visualization once again is um, being able to create images in your head, okay? Visual, you can add a visualization component, okay? And ask them, if I make this pattern, show me what it will look like when it flips sideways, okay? And they've got to produce this pattern. So it adds a visualization component, but it's also a visual spatial component as well, because are they able to manipulate the images in their head to know where things are in relation to each other? So that's a very high level sort of visual thinking um, with a visual memory and a visualization component, okay? So if you have, as I say, if this high level stuff, if you have a child that is actually struggling to visualize or struggling to retain a visual image, you got to take it back to basics, okay? So one of the basic games is getting them to touch and feel. So for example, back to my pen, if they can't create an image of the pen in their head and you get kids that can't, that literally aren't able to visualize a pen in their head, 
you got to start from basics, which is touch and feel. So getting them to feel, okay, while closing their eyes. So relying on their touch or their tactile senses to help create the visual, to help create a visual image. Then you actually build it on from there. Okay, so that's summarizing visual memory and visualization. So before I end the webinar or finish the webinar up tonight, I just want to briefly touch on things that you can supplement with vision therapy. Okay, so in terms of lenses, apart from the corrective lenses such as hyperopia, myopia, or correcting their astigmatism, if they're experiencing a lot of near point stress or binocular vision stress, you may want to consider prescribing a therapeutic lens, especially when they have a very fragile binocular system and you know they can benefit from a little bit of low plus, then consider prescribing them that. You don't need to prescribe vision therapy, vision therapy on its own. We can prescribe a bit of, or you can prescribe both as well, okay? Lenses is when you want to help them train, improve their vergences as well as their accommodation. You can consider prescribing training, training lenses as well. Now, tinted lenses. Okay, so there's a particular group of children or people that benefit from a tinted colored lens. Okay, um, you will find that once you prescribe, let's say, a blue colored lens, a blue, a blue tint or rose colored tint, they're able to read a lot more fluently, smoothly, and proficiently, okay? Um, the best analogy that I can give is that you are in a noisy room, okay? So you and your friend are in this noisy room, and there's a lot of people in this room chattering in the background. There's music blasting on in the background. It's extremely noisy, Okay, and you are trying to listen to your friend. Okay, your friend is trying to tell you something, but you're putting all the effort to try and pick up what your friend is trying to say. It's extremely hard because there's a lot of noise in the background. Okay, this analogy is extremely similar to these group of people. For some reason, when they read the text on the page, okay, they experience of what we call visual noise okay which makes them extremely hard to read for some reason they can't pick up the words on the page when you prescribe them a tinted lens okay which may a tinted lens as you know a tint cuts out a particular wavelength of the um visible spec visible light spectrum okay it eliminates that visual noise okay and they're able to read a lot more proficiently it's like suddenly you know, they can see the words on the page, okay? So you have this group of people that can benefit from a tinted lens, okay? Now, another thing that you can supplement and you probably may, you may or may not have heard this before is syntonic or eye lights. So what syntonic therapy is, is that it's a particular device emitting a colored light, which the person views, and the colored light actually influences or impacts the autonomic nervous system, okay? So the color light basically made, they, we're, we're getting them to look at a particular wavelength of the visible spectrum, okay? And when you impact the autonomic nervous system in a particular way, and as we know, the autonomic system has connections to the eye, it helps open up the visual pathway more and allows the vision therapy to be far more effective. So that's syntonic therapy, that's syntonic therapy in a nutshell. Eye lights are very similar in the sense that instead of viewing at a color light, the, the lights are put into goggles, okay? Um, they're normally flickering lights and they wear them for a certain period and that helps open up the visual channels and the visual pathway, okay? And lastly, keep in mind is that as optometrists, we're only looking at enhancing the visual component related relating to vision okay. um, related to learning sorry okay so there's a lot of complexes um, complex processes involved when it comes to learning in the classroom particularly when it comes to learning to read when we're learning to read there is a verbal component as well as an auditory component which the child has to integrate it okay so it's not just purely visual it involves other senses as well so particularly if the child has language problems or has trouble with speech, they may benefit from seeing a speech pathologist 
Okay. Um, if they have trouble with eye hand skills, we don't need to bear all that burden. Okay. We can, or bilateral integration or fine motor skills or even gross motor skills. That's when they may be able to benefit from seeing an occupational therapist. If you get an extremely floppy child with low muscle tone, can't sit still, can't sit up straight, this is a not a, um, have a, will have a lot of issues already, not just to do with learning in the classroom. Um, if you feel like there's some muscle involvement, um, muscle involvement there, they may be able to benefit from seeing a physiotherapist and the chiropractor. Okay, so just keep in mind that we don't need to bear all that burden. Um, we can, you know, co-manage it with other health professionals as well. So that's it for tonight, guys. I want to thank you for taking the time out to hearing me talk tonight. I hope it has been of some value to you. And I can, it's, it's definitely a different way of looking at vision. I hope you guys are open to different ways of looking at vision because definitely it would serve you later on in the future when you're prescribing vision therapy or when you're examining the child, okay? And once again, thank you for, um, thank you to Foroptom for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all tonight, okay? So I think we've got time for questions and answers. So over to you, Manashwi. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chris. That was indeed a wonderful presentation and I'm sure that our audiences have immensely enjoyed it. So the first question that we'll be receiving from our audience is what is the difference between learning difficulty and learning disability? Um, they come all under the same umbrellas. Okay, so essentially what learning, yeah, essentially they're the same. Okay, um, disability implies that they're unable to learn at all <laughs> um, based on the actual definition. Learning difficulty is that they can do it, but it's extremely difficult. Okay, there's so many spectrums of learning difficulties and learning disabilities. Um, in terms of the actual definition, I just term it under all one umbrella. Okay, I try not to delve into the detail too much. When I ever get a child in the chair that is struggling in the classroom and then, you know, the parents are concerned they may have dyslexia or, you know, they can't read or, you know, they have, we can't teach the child to read. I don't normally delve into the definition too much and I just focus on the visual components, okay? But in terms of difficulty and disability, when you look at the definition itself, um, difficulties meaning that they can do it, but it's extremely difficult, but disability meaning that they're, for some reason they aren't able to do it at all, no matter how hard you try them, okay? In terms of learning disability, there's a lot more, if, you, if it's a disability, there's a lot more complex issues involved. So the child will have a myriad of other problems as well. So once again, you've got to look at not just the eyes, not just the, not just the eye part, you actually got to examine the child as a whole, okay? So I hope that answers your question. So the next Hello? question, the next yep. question we have is how does anti-gravity affect learning? Okay. How does anti-gravity um, affect learning? Great question. Okay. So anti-gravity meaning, do I know where I am in space? Do I have an internal awareness of where I am in space? Okay. If I don't know where I am, how can I efficiently team my eyes correctly on the page? How can I team my eye correctly, effectively, and efficiently on the page if I have no idea where I am in space? Okay, so if there's no internal awareness, they cannot direct their eyes correctly. No matter how much VT um, vision therapy that you do on training their vergences, their eye teaming skills, accommodation skills or ocular motor skills because if they have no internal awareness where they are how can they place things how can they place their eyes or control their eyes correctly another example is that if they don't know the difference between their rights and lefts okay so if i have no internal awareness of rights and lefts 
how can you expect a child to recognize the difference between B, D, P, and Q, which is essentially all the same letters, but they're orientated differently and they've been given a different name. So if I have no internal awareness of right and left, how can I learn to recognize symbols on essentially symbols on the page, letters on the page, which is actually symbols, and know that, you know, and know the difference in the orientation. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, the next question we have received is, what are the conditions uh, that you would prefer to prescribe the tint and how does tint benefit? Uh, can you repeat the question again? Yes, what are the conditions in which you would prefer to prescribe tint to the patient and how do the tint uh, you know, benefit those patients? Okay, so if I find that they're not benefiting, so let's say they sit in the consultation chair and they're not benefiting with plus lenses, for example, and they're still struggling to read, Normally, I would basically try another test called the pattern glare, which is basically, I don't have an example here, but it's, a, it's basically a grading test. So if you know spatial grading, which is basically a series of vertical lines of black and white stripes combined together like a grating. Okay, so when they view a grating, um, some of them feel like there's a lot of, they will describe it as a lot of disturbances, like a lot of shimmering. If they experience a lot of shimmering and they're unable to benefit from plus lenses, that's normally a clue for me to try and see whether tinted lenses work, okay? So tinted lenses work by eliminating a certain wavelength going into their visual system. And as I was giving earlier about the example of visual noise, um, the analogy, we can apply that to, let's say, a noisy background. So if you're trying to hear someone in a noisy background, you can't hear them correctly because you can't hear them properly because you've got noise in the background. For If you can apply the same analogy to the page, for some reason, they're experiencing a lot of visual noise on the page, just like in the pattern glare test where they're experiencing a lot of shimmering when they're looking at a grading image. Okay, and for some reason, although we cannot explain it just yet, but it benefits them for that group of people, for some reason, um, prescribing them a tinted lens eliminates that visual noise and they can actually read words on the page a lot more fluently, okay? How do we know to prescribe a tinted lens? Uh, there, are, there are many ways. Once you use tinted filters, Okay, and then basically you place them on certain texts and ask whether the patient they can see it a lot easier. You've got other tests such as a colorimeter, which the patient views as a color light. And then basically based on their subjective responses, they will tell you which color they feel more comfortable looking at. Okay, so hopefully, so I use the analogy of the back, the, the back, the audio background noise to explain how they experience visual noise and how the tinted lenses um, eliminate that visual noise, okay? We still don't know how it eliminates it. It's still undergoing a fair bit of study, but for some reason it does for a certain group of people, not all people, but for a certain group of people. And one of the tests that I, that I will be using to flag this will be, one of it would be the pattern glare test, okay? Which I haven't tonight because um, the topic was about vision therapy. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people tell uh, syntonics uh, reduce myopia. So what do you think? Is it true? Um, syntonics can be used as a supplementary for myopia control. I wouldn't be prescribing solely syntonics on uh, myopia control. So syntonics can definitely help. Um, but you've got to be doing a lot of other things as well. So depending on what the patient wants, um, you can also apply um, vision therapy to help with the myopia control as well. Okay, so there is some, bene um, there is some um, benefit there in prescribing syntonics. I don't normally, I personally myself haven't prescribed syntonics just based on myopia, but based on the literature and the research that I've looked up on, yes, it can help with myopia but I wouldn't be if I do that I wouldn't be solely 
prescribing just syntonic therapy, just for myopia control. Uh, so the next question we've received is, uh, can primitive reflexes be completely integrated with exercises? And are there any other exercises for integrating other primitive reflexes? Uh, can you please repeat that again, Manash? I didn't get the first part of the question. Yeah, so can primitive reflexes be completely integrated with exercises? And are there any other exercises for integrating other primitive reflexes? Yes, any other exercises. I'll just show you a book. Yeah, I've got a book. Just one moment. I'll see if I can bring a book here. There are lots of exercises for primitive reflexes. So if I show you the book here, okay, primitive reflex training. Okay, so the primitive reflexes that I mentioned, that I briefly mentioned in the webinar tonight are associated with vision, okay? And there's a lot of activities that you can uh, that you can prescribe. If you feel like you cannot, um, there's no other health professionals that can help with primitive reflexes, okay? So if I show you the book here, you've got a myriad of exercises which you can use, okay? Um, so there, there are activities to help integrate it. For those, for patients who have very prominent retained reflexes, they've got to just keep doing the same activities, okay? Um, especially when they've got like special needs um, or whether they're very slow in learning, there's a lot of primitive reflexes showing up because they're experiencing a fair bit of developmental delay when they were growing up. And those reflexes don't get integrated, they become retained. Um, you cannot retain, um, you cannot integrate a primitive reflexes in one week or two weeks for some of these kids. They've got to be just doing it routinely to help them integrate, okay? But after a certain number of weeks, okay, you can, you will definitely see the vast improvement. And yes, you can, you know, slow, slowly, slowly help them integrate it week by week, okay? Uh, so uh, we have another question from the audience again about the uh, tint prescription. So you've mentioned that uh, you check with the plus uh, prescription and you see the noises produced. So is it just plus prescription that produces noises or are there any other conditions where you also recommend tints? Um, okay, so normally if they experience the pattern, um, they experience some shimmering or pattern disturbance in the pattern glare test. Yes, I will check to see whether plus lenses will actually reduce the pattern disruption. Um, normally, when they experience some pattern disruption in the pattern glare test, they will have some sort of, I will have other findings to show that they've got accommodative and convergence um, dysfunction as well, okay? Um, so I will check for that. If it doesn't improve for whatever reason, um, then that's when I will go on to tint it. And sometimes if they do improve, but the pattern glare test is still there, then I may decide to prescribe both tinted and plus into one prescription, okay? So it, it depends on the individual, okay? Not, there's no, um, as, as much as I like to give you a quick and easy formula, it's not, there's no quick and easy formula. Prescribing lenses, prescribing tint, um, comes from experience and it slowly becomes an art, okay? There's no mathematical formula. When you examine a child, okay, you don't just examine the eyes, you examine the whole, the person as a whole, okay? So when the child comes into the room, I'll be observing how the child is walking. When they step onto the chair, I'll be observing what leg are they using to step on the chair. If I give them a pencil to draw, I'll be looking at which hand are they using to draw it with. So, and every child is different. So depending on the testing and depending on how they're responding, okay, then that's when I would navigate on whether to just prescribe plus lenses or just tinted lenses or a little bit of, or maybe a combination of both. But when I mention about tinted lenses, it's, um, it's only for a certain group of people that can benefit from it, okay? So don't, it's 
a certain selection of group of people, not every child will benefit from tinted lenses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Grace. We are done with the questions now. And on behalf of our Optum team and our audiences, I would like to thank you for giving you giving us your valuable time and knowledge and the lovely experience today. And uh, thank you so much. Um, it's um, it's a privilege to be able to present to you all tonight. Thank you. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> a little bit under the weather. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, this uh, brings us to the end of the session now. And I would also like to thank our audiences for being so supportive, interactive, and attentive. And we will be back with more programs and sessions. Meanwhile, please like this video, subscribe to our channel, and you can also visit us at www.foroptom.com. Also follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. On this note, I'd like to end the session. Stay home, stay safe, and have a good day. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Yes, we're done now. Okay, we're done now? Yes, oh. that was a great presentation. Uh, thank you so much.